stimulating conversation. We're glad to have you here in Columbia, San Francisco. This is a relatively new location. We uh, took occupancy in September, and we do the, have four degree programs uh, displayed there on the wall that we uh, run out of this location. And uh, we're very glad to have our panelists. And I'm going to introduce uh, them briefly. Doug Crawford is uh, with uh, Mission Bay Capital, and uh, Barry Selleck, Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Partnerships uh, and Business Development at uh, UCSF, and Robbie Kilpatrick, who is a CEO and founder of a, a company called Health Innovation for People. And that's the panel, and we have Dr. Klitzman, Dr. Robert Klitzman from Columbia University, here from New York, who will be our moderator. So, welcome, and uh, thank you all. Great, well thank you, Michael, and thank you all for coming, and I should say we also have about 80 people joining us online. Oh. Uh, so this is being simulcast, and uh, they will be asking questions to those of you. Oh, nice. This is a camera. Where, where's the camera? Oh, That's there. the camera. Oh. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you have questions, uh, email them. And Samir Lada, who's our associate director, will be, uh, during the question and answer period, will be fielding questions from them. So please feel free to be part of the discussion as well. Uh, and uh, I thought we'd get right started. Our, we have an amazing panel here, and they've all done amazing things. I encourage you to look at the bio and the information, their bios we sent out. They've each founded 20 companies in the past two days. Uh, uh, many companies they have founded and been on the board of, et cetera, et cetera, and they've done remarkable things, uh, each of them. Um, and uh, if I, we, we could spend the whole evening just talking about what they've done, which is amazing. But I thought we'd get straight into the ethics, and I thought I would ask them um, to describe a little bit about what they do, but also, uh, are there ethical issues that come up in the areas in which you work, and if so, what are they? And then we'll talk about how we might think about them. So, Robbie, do you want to start, or more broad thoughts about these issues? Sure. Um, so I'm, I, I'm here, I suppose, with um, three caps on. Uh, one cap is, uh, for those of you that know the Commonwealth Club of California, which is just around the corner in our brand new $28 million building, we were founded in 1902, and we have 25,000 members, and I become the co-chair of health and medicine. So they've asked me to start bringing some interesting program that would appeal to uh, younger people and a diverse audience, that kind of thing. So in August, we're having a new series called The Art and Science of Well-Being. So thinking about, you know, health in positive terms rather than negative, you know, which would be the absence of disease. So health is a positive state. I'm also here as a budding author. I'm working on a book called Health, the Whole Story, The Arguments for a Healthy Society. So the root of the word health is whole. So health is basically everything that affects all of us in this room that you could possibly imagine, not just get diet and ex exercise. So the goal is to have this 120, 130 page little essay on the desk of every member of Congress and other leaders before the 2020 election. That's my, that's my goal. So in the moral arguments, the, the economic <coughs> arguments, the social, the political, why can't we have a health care system for all people in America? So that, that's what I'm here representing. And then the last thing is I'm the CEO of Health Innovation for People, or HIP, and we are benchmarking best practices around the world, health practices, say, from childhood obesity to anything you could imagine, where groups have actually moved the dial, they've made significant improvements, we're going to benchmark it, we're going to launch it on Martin Luther King Day in San Francisco in January, uh, it'll be a free platform, and so people will be able to look at it and, and get positive examples rather than the negative, cynical, pessimistic news in the news media. What works? Why does it work? How does it work? So if you're in Oakland or San Francisco and you're in a school district and you want to deal with childhood obesity, this is how they dealt with it in Brisbane, Australia, or Ethiopia, or whatever. So that's me. So I guess I represent health as a positive set of innovations to improve the lives of all of us in this room. That's me. Great. My focus is much narrower than that. <laughs> um, I'm a Vice Chancellor of Business Development, Innovation, and Partnerships at UCSF. I also happen to be a partner of Doug's Admission Bay Capital, although he does the heavy lifting. 
Um, <coughs> I came to UCSF about two years ago, um, having done a postdoc there in the 1980s and then gone off to work in the biotech industry. And in the biotech industry, uh, worked, uh, founded a number of companies, served on the boards of more companies. In fact, one with John Hefty sitting there in the back, uh, uh, a company called Protein Design Labs. And the most recent company that I founded and was CEO of for 15 years, I founded it, we did venture financing, took the company public, and then 15 years later, unblinded two pivotal phase three clinical trials in patients with pancreatic cancer and soft tissue sarcoma, only to discover that we missed our primary endpoint, in one case by two out of 693 patients. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that was a little demoralizing. And at that point, I kind of stepped back and realized that I could either do another company that, you know, 10 years, 12 years from now might have another binary outcome, which could be negative again, or I could come back to UCSF and work with the myriad of faculty who themselves would like to found companies but don't really have the bandwidth or the expertise to do so themselves and help them do that. So that's primarily what I do. I'm, as a side, I'm responsible for all technology licensing within UCSF. Uh, we also teach courses in entrepreneurship, and we have programs that fund early discovery programs, such as uh, Catalyst. We provide modest grants to faculty for them to demonstrate some sort of proof of concept for a program that might lead to a product. But my real passion is working with faculty uh, founders who have developed you know, meaningful technology would like to commercialize it, but don't have the bandwidth or the expertise themselves to do that. So just to uh, follow up on that a little bit, so in terms of ethical issues that come up in, in, in those kinds of activities, are they there? Do you see them? What would you say? Or well, policy questions, ethical questions, tensions? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, just one example of an ethical issue that comes up occasionally. In fact, I was just talking with some faculty this afternoon about it is around inventorship. Okay, who's actually invented technology? Mm -hmm. Many of you may be aware that there is an outstanding dispute between the Broad Institute and uh, Harvard and Cambridge and uh, UC Berkeley, Jennifer Doudna, who you know was the inventor of so-called CRISPR technology. And it's, so there's an ongoing dispute. Uh, I, I think to those of us from the University of California, perspective is pretty obvious who invented CRISPR, but to the U.S. Patent Office it's been less so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do deal with ethical issues around inventorship, um, and that's at a, a high level, you know, between the road and between UC. Within UCSF, we occasionally run into issues between faculty who claim that, well, you know, I'm actually the inventor. I simply used a cell line that was provided by that other faculty member to implement my idea so they don't qualify as an inventor the other party however may feel otherwise so there's some ethical right. issues in that regard and I would imagine behind that is a lot of money often on the line well unfortunately that does factor into people's thinking especially when you have some uh, exits like we've had recently with a company cell design labs that was founded primarily by uh, faculty member Wendell Lim and colleagues of his that had a remarkable exit, you know, just two years after founding uh, with, you know, probably $40 million invested. The company was acquired by Gilead for $567 million. So other faculty see that and suddenly, you know, their <laughs> eyes light up and they think, well, my God, if Wendell can do it, <laughs> I should be able to do it. So yeah, that, that does factor into it. Although with that said, and I want to give Doug his, his due yep. here to introduce himself and what he does. With that said, the vast majority of the faculty that I deal with, they simply have an idea, an invention that they really want to see developed and get to patients, to benefit mm -hmm. patients. It's really, in all honesty, it's, it's truly the exceptional faculty member who's motivated primarily by the financial upside. So last, by no means least, Doug? So it's interesting, uh, taking, uh, starting at that point, we, um, 
So I used to work with uh, Rich Kelly and the team at QV3, and QV3 is an entity created by the state to help foment economic activity around the campuses, not necessarily, uh, no licensing responsibilities with ferry carriers, but just uh, how can we how can we stimulate uh, more startup activity? And so we began with a, a conviction that of the uh, $30 billion that the NIH spends, tragically most of it ends up not serving patients or products for society, most of it ends up populating the basements of the library and beautiful bound journals and buying its live contribution. You're not a little cynical <laughs> about that, are you? <laughs> and we thought, you know, within that sea of publications, were there ideas that could have a profound impact that le were left, you know, withering on the vine for want of opportunity? And so we created a tiny little incubator uh, inside the new QB3 building on the Mission Bay campus. And six uh, startup companies came, all of them you know, just scruffy young postdoc graduate students, none of them capable of attracting capital from the companies. We went out before we did this, I'll get to the ethical stuff. That's okay. No, uh, we went out before I said, hey, you, to the venture capitalists who, that we knew, we said, should we start an incubator? And 100% of them said, don't bother, you'll just create an intensive care unit for little companies. Very <laughs> cheery thought. And so we said, ah, but it's our mission with the state. We should go ahead and we did it. And what do you know, but four of the first six companies closed venture financing, substantial venture financing rounds within the first two years. And the fifth company was acquired by Affymetrics for $25 million right out of the incubator all within two years. And so take that, Sand Hill Road. There is gold in those hills. We just need to give it a chance. And so ever since then, that's been the focus of my efforts, is to help entrepreneurial scientists turn an idea into something real. Um, but the ethical questions that originally got us talking had to do with the uh, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. So we run a venture capital fund. Some of our LPs are institutional investors. And I don't know uh, if you've been tracking the travails of the investment office at Yale, but lots of campus investment office are under a lot of pressure from their stakeholders, their students and staff, to say, why the hell are you investing in that heroin company? You know, and uh, so they are often blindsided by that. Sometimes they're several steps away from the actual investment in the meth lab, and, <laughs> but they're nonetheless responsible for it, right? So um, we actually uh, proactively worked with one of our LPs in this set, who was the uh, UC Office of the President, who manages the retirement funds for all of uh, UC employees, to say, we don't want you blindsided. We don't want you to find the front page of the student newspaper to cry in some investment that Mission Bay Capital made. So we developed a program which Robert was interested in, in which we make predictions about the moral and ethical and political risks associated with our investments. And we add that to our quarterly reports to our limited partners. Do you, do you want to maybe say a little bit about that? So, like, what 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 is listed on that, and how does that right. get determined, and how, what kind of pickup has there been, or interest, yeah. or? I think the thing that would really make them most anxious would be, you know, the the whole debacle around Purdue, right? You know, God, if the office of the president were suddenly to find their name associated, you know, initially happily with positive returns from the fund, but ultimately a great embarrassment that the whole mission of the institution is to help people, and here we are hurting people. And because that's, I would say, I brought that up because it's the most sort of extreme case we could think of, um, more so than Theranos, right? So Theranos was you know, corrupt business practice, and you know, what are you going to do? Here, intentionally people brought, you know, hurt people in the process of doing what they want to do, and anyway. So um, we wanted 99.99% of what the venture capital industry does in the life sciences is about finding drugs to cure cancer. And so I don't think anyone, you can shine as bright a light as you want on us and it's going to be positive. But for that one thousand case we got it, we 
we need to be upfront with the risk and benefits, and they need to be pre-informed before the student is fit for his. And actually, I wouldn't let Theranos off the hook because they were conducting, you know, um, assays yeah. on patients' blood and coming up with faulty readings, which mm -hmm. could have been life-threatening, you know, for many of those patients. I agree. So it'll be interesting to see how that ultimately plays out, how the characters responsible for that ultimately uh, make their retribution to society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another area that um, that you know we spend a lot of time uh, wrestling with within the entire academic uh, medical center universe. So it's not just limited to UCSF, but it's this question of if the drive is to improve patient outcomes and reduce the cost of health care, which you're clearly interested mm -hmm. in, isn't there value in the millions of patients worth of data that have been accumulated over mm -hmm. the years? It could be mined in a way that could allow us to construct maybe predictive models uh, so that we could head off uh, a lot of the issues that lead to you know, longer term hospitalization of patients with associated <coughs> costs uh, with those. And of course, the ethical issue is you know, well, how do you use uh, confidential patient data? without compromising the confidentiality of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a lot of effort going into de-identifying existing patient records, uh, of which there are about 15 million within the UC database, which wow. accounts for you know, a meaningful proportion of the US population. But you know, how do you access and, and leverage that data for patient benefit, actually for societal benefit, without disclosing the identity of those patients. And that's a huge ongoing challenge uh, that we at UCSF have spent a lot of time and a tool uh, Butte's group trying to figure out how to de-identify data in such a way that you would, it would be impossible to reconstruct uh, who the original uh, patients were, as well as other approaches that are a little bit more creative. And of course, I think that becomes even a bigger challenge with genomic data because one's mm. genome is some say identifying. Well, when you look at the deal that 23andMe did with GSK recently, which was, uh, you know, provides a, a wealth of genetic information now to a pharmaceutical company that's interested in identifying what the next important targets are going to be for <laughs> therapeutic intervention, you wonder, you know, all of those patients, I guess you call them patients, who, you know, probably signed a consent form without reading it carefully now suddenly realize that all of their genetic info that 23andMe derived is now being shared with the pharmaceutical company. <coughs> now, I, could, I can defend the industry because at the end they're motivated to create medicines mm -hmm. to treat significant unmet medical needs. But if you're a consumer of health care and you're, you, know, you got a $500 deductible and your prescription medicines cost you know, 10 times that over the course of the year, you're probably not real happy with that. Right. So, Robbie, Dr. thoughts? Dr. Klitzman? Yes. You just, um, in the back, we're having a hard time hearing, so okay. we just ask yeah. the, we don't want to mic people, but if you just speak up a little bit, uh, okay. the air conditioning is making it hard for us to hear in the back rows. Okay, all right. So, everyone speak up. Uh, Project. Project. Is there anything we should repeat or just? <laughs> no, I just noticed people were okay. having a hard time. He heard that he couldn't hear. hear. It was all brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> he, heard, he heard what he couldn't hear. Yeah, right, right. If you could say the part again about this isn't for re repeating outside <laughs> of the room, that's yeah. what I wanted to hear. So, Robbie, thoughts on this? Or, uh, well, I want to expand the topic just a little bit and say that I, I do feel strongly uh, in talking to a lot of people at, across the spectrum of, of health care, not only in the United States, but you know, in about 100 countries around the world, where they have a different system than, than we have. Uh, the sense that there, there is a moral dilemma, there's an ethical dilemma at the center of our very paradigm. And Doug just said a moment ago, the vast majority of, uh, of uh, venture capital goes into, how shall I say, companies that are treating diseases, both common ones and, and rare ones. So at its most extreme, you could say, I will say, the United States does not have a health care system. 
We have a disease management system. So the vast majority of all the financial resources that go into this thing called healthcare does not go into building health. It goes into expanding innovation and training specialists who can treat people in clinics and hospitals and and there's nothing wrong with that. But but what's wrong with it is that there's there's an ethical dilemma at the heart of the very paradigm, which is that very there's no one in the United States, for example, responsible for the health of the American people. There's not one person. So there's competing venture capitalists, there's competing hospitals, there are competing universities. You name it, there's thousands and thousands of thousands, and everybody's doing great work. And, and you look at the annual reports, you go, that's amazing. It's disintegrated. It's not focused on improving the health of the people in this audience. Now, that's not to criticize UCSF. I'm not, that's not to criticize Columbia. That's not to criticize anybody, but to say that I'd like to suggest that we need a paradigm shift in the United States where we, we give a certain amount of money to research that's focused on disease and we give a certain amount of money that's focused on building health, reducing child obesity, reducing reliance on fast food, reducing reliance on fizzy drinks. So I think personally I would say we have a public health crisis in the United States that we are not taking serious. So over to you. <laughs> the only comment I would share is that I don't know that it's going to be the large pharma companies that are capable of making that shift. I will say that some of the smaller, nimble biotech companies, and one of which comes to mind immediately, and I'm not a shareholder, but Unity, founded by the serial entrepreneur Ned David, is focused on increasing health span. He's very explicit. It's not lifespan, it's health span. So it's increasing you know, the length of time that you're healthy, not necessarily just pushing your lifespan out two or three years in spite of the fact you may be on a respirator for, you know. So quality of life. Quality of life, yeah, improving health span. But I think it's going to be up to the smaller, more nimble companies to, you know, implement that type of philosophy, and it's you know, going to take some time. Can I make one quick comment? Yes. So Bernard J. Tyson, who's the CEO of Kaiser Permanente, who, if you read his LinkedIn blogs or whatever, he's very committed to improving you know, health, not only of Kaiser members, but of, of Californians. And they've made a substantial, a huge $200 million investment in affordable housing. And mm -hmm. they've done that because they said, mm -hmm. there's no amount of drugs or treatments we can give our members if they don't have a place to live. So there's an example, there's a positive example of a healthcare company where they're both the provider and the insurer. So they've eliminated the insurance industry completely. If any of you are members of Kaiser, which I am, but this is not an infomercial. But that's an example where I think an organization is this, who has doctors and nurses and research and all that, and they've said, you know, health is, is, is bigger than just drugs. Well, UCSF was recently the beneficiary of, I think it was a $25 million gift from Lynn and Mark Benioff okay. to study homelessness in San Francisco. And so, you know, I don't know what the outcome of that's going to be or what the methodology is going to be, but, you know, the fact that, you know, there's sufficient interest within the university with a philanthropist who sees the need in his own backyard to help get homeless people into, you know, uh, housing and whatnot, I think that's an encouraging sign. It is. So, do you, Doug, yeah, you? I, I just would weigh in on two things. One is to say that these are not mutually exclusive. We don't want, mm -hmm. we want to do both. We don't want to do one or the other, True. okay? Uh, uh, secondly, I wouldn't underestimate the capacity and power of entrepreneurs to solve even that problem. And I'll give you a wonderful example. Whole Biome is a company that we've had uh, in our shop you know, since uh, we opened the doors in 2013. They moved in when the paint was still moist. Um, and they've taken an approach with microbiome to use it as a medical food. Not, it won't be a prescribed drug. It will be a fraction of what it would cost. Or if you look at Evolve, which is a, a microbiome for, for newborns, that may end up having profound impacts on diseases as disparate as asthma. Uh, so we, I would say, 
we want to power entrepreneurs to empower entrepreneurs to solve a lot of these uh, challenges. I do think that there's something we don't often recognize, which is that the, there are a lot of dogs that don't bark. So there are a lot of uh, indications, mo modalities that are ignored because, forgive me for saying this, this is going to make me unpopular in this room. Well, it's, it's a business school. Make mm -hmm. it is that we've re eliminated the financial incentives to, to solve the problem. Vaccines, uh, antibiotics are dead ends for the biotech industry. No one would touch them with a 10-foot pole. Because we've said, George Bush, a Republican, when we had the, the bird flu, one of the first things he said, oh, maybe we need to nationalize candy flu. So no one is going to go down the path of producing a drug that's needed in the next bird flu if even a Republican will nationalize it. But the federal government is, is developing uh, bioweapons in, in their laboratories right now for, for use in warfare. So there's no reason why federal uh, research institutions could not be reoriented if there was a political will. To the idea, though, that the academic public institutions could become drug discovery and development, discovery, yes, early stage development, maybe real development companies is quixotic. The challenge is you have to put so many eggs into such small numbers of baskets, it would bankrupt the research and development enterprise of the universities if we said, okay, we want you to start doing phase three clinical studies. They're just way too expensive. It's the wrong skill set. It's not the kind of thing you put a graduate student or postdoc on. You need to have a biotech industry that complements the academic enterprise the both are enriched by that marriage. But getting back to your comment earlier that a lot of NIH funding was leading to res primary research that ends up just in journals, I mean, that would seem perhaps to go the other way. That I hate to tell you this. This is a dark secret. But there are almost no faculty members at UCSF or Berkeley working on vaccines. There was a little vestigial uh, work still going on in HIV, I believe. But the idea of a little cancer vaccines, right, which is sort of the I.O. world intersected with vaccines. Um, the, uh, another one is uh, uh, gene therapy. So uh, now it's back in bloom, but for 20 years it was a dead subject. And surprisingly, the NIH interests and biotech interests bear uh, a surprising correlation. So. Uh, David Schaefer, who is a great uh, gene therapy vector developer at Berkeley, was really all alone. There were no, no peers. And so I, I think it's a little bit surprising that the NIH budgets don't reflect. And the reason is partially scientific, though, of those I'm really interested in scientific subjects. They're not multiplicatively interesting scientific subjects, like finding a novel gene, a whole new function. And then secondly, there's a recognition, well, okay, here's a, here's a field, here's a task, quiz, quiz coming. What are the, what is the mission of the NIH? Is basic research, expanding human knowledge, part of the mission of the NIH? It's not. That's an NSF mission. The NIH is about, let's see if I can do these four. It's about improving health. There's uh, economic development. There's ethics, forgetting the fourth, but knowledge is not one of them. It's about drug. It's about making people's health better. That's what the NIH is for. And so they are true to that mission ultimately, which is if it can't ultimately help a patient in maybe a 20-year life uh, viewpoint, then we really shouldn't be doing it. So let me come back to some of the issues that actually Rob was mentioning. So. Is there a tension, do you think, between venture capital and entrepreneurs who have fiduciary responsibilities to investors and return on investment? Does that lead to work on drugs that may be very costly, perhaps too costly for most people? Is that a concern? Should that be a concern? I think the concern should be, and I was at the WHO a couple of weeks ago, and, and they, they, they say right to the face of an American, you know, you spend, and we know these statistics, you spend dramatically more per capita on health care than any country in the world, a and yet you're not even in the top 20 in, in terms of outcomes. So, so it is true to say that 
at the highest level at UCSF and Stanford and Ber you know the innovation is is amazing and the, the the scientific work is phenomenal, but where the rubber meets the road in terms of health outcomes, we are not competitive, and and so we are actually are continuing to decline. So in my lifetime, we've gone from about number seven to like thirty one, and, and I see nothing yet that's going to reverse that slide. So I'll give you a sl another statistic. When I was, I, was born here, I was born here, when I was in high school, in terms of education outcomes, uh, Connecticut was number one, science and math, and, and Mississippi was number 50. And, and California was number two. In 2019, California is number 49, and Connecticut's number one, and Mississippi is number 50. So we've gone from number two to number 49. What, what is the metric again? It's In it, terms of uh, exam results. Uh, and of high school students. High school so, students, yeah. So I'm just trying to give you a, a trend more mm -hmm. than anything else, which is I believe to allow the health of the American people or people living in the United States, regardless of their nationality or their citizenship, to allow that number to continue to climb is, in my view, a moral challenge. It is primarily a moral, it's a political challenge, it's an economic challenge, but it's a moral challenge. And I see nobody in, in office or running for office who has serious ideas about how to reverse this, this trend. So again, I, I think it's a slightly different conversation from, from what you're saying, and I have total respect for UCSF and all of them. Yeah, it's a different thing. But I want you to think about that, that, that there's a moral dilemma at the heart of the problem, which is we're spending all this money and we continue to slide as a society. And I find that personally unacceptable, which is why I accepted the job as CEO of HIP. Barry, so, yes? Yeah, I mean, to get to the question about whether venture capitalists only invest in companies that are going to sell very expensive drugs and make them a lot of money. Clearly, the returns factor into their decisions of what companies they're going to invest in. But by the same token, you know, there are a number of venture capital investors, as well as just capitalists in general, and I mentioned Mark Benioff earlier, who the more successful he is personally, or the more successful some of our venture capital investors are in the Bay Area, the more returns they make, the more they turn around and donate money to important programs at, you know, UCSF, which is a public university, and just to clue everyone in, in spite of the fact it's a state university in California, about only 4% of our budget comes from California taxpayers, okay? The rest of it comes from federal grants and through philanthropy. So if Brooke Byers at Kleiner Perkins makes a huge return on an investment in a UCSF spin-out company, and then turns around and makes a donation that leads to the creation of Buyer's Hall or Buyer's Auditorium or Buyer's whatever, that's fine as far as I'm concerned. To be fair, from the founding of the University of California in 1868 till 1968 when Ronald Reagan became governor of California, there were no fees at the University of California. Young students now are surprised when I say that because the state paid more. Yeah. Yeah, it's a political decision. When I went to Berkeley, I paid $212.50 a term, and student loans didn't even exist because you didn't need to have one. So, you know, again, I think it's an, when I go to China a lot, they go like, you know what, we're actually investing in infrastructure for 100 years in the future, and you guys are just buying a lot of stuff on Amazon, and you're, you're crippling your students, and you're putting them in debt. So I think we should be fighting hard to get the state legislature to pay more money for the University of California so you can do more of your good work and rely less on philanthropists and rely more on people like us who, who are taxpayers. <laughs> I want you to have more money but from a different source if possible. Yeah, but many taxpayers already believe that all of those overcompensated physicians at UCSF make too much money as it is, regardless of the fact that the, do they? Pay, do they? the pay scale <laughs> of UCSF physicians and scientists is about 80% of the market. Yeah. Okay. Compare their comp to their counterparts at Stanford, and it's probably 75 to 80% of what their counterparts at Stanford are making. That's a public relations campaign that begins today. You know, we should be, <laughs> making, yeah. we should be making more of the argument for public funding of state universities. Right. Yes. I would say.
So how about going forward? I mean, uh, Doug, for instance, are there things we should be doing differently given sort of the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots and the fact that the U.S. health indices show that we're number 30 or something on various indices? Should the world of venture capital be doing something different, just keep going what it's doing? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, all right. Well, let me keep getting myself in trouble here. Yeah. So, uh, so well, first of all, <clears throat> you know, these extra. Don't, don't worry. There's no right answer. So that's. Good. <laughs> I can pass in great regard. Uh, um, so the a deal that we have made is that we will provide economic incentives for people to take the risk of bringing a drug to patients. And, but that's a short-term windfall. It's, you know, it's a 20-year patent, but God, you've chewed up 12 of that before you've seen your first patient. So you get five, seven, eight years of this uh, outsized profit, and that lottery ticket is what induces people to play the game at all. You take that lottery ticket away, the game stops happening, and that's what happened in vaccines and antibiotics and other places. It's happened in medical devices. So all of the sectors where we're not allowing that to happen. So you all, all of these questions often have a time scale element that's not discussed. So I will benefit, I'm too old to benefit from almost any innovation that's occurring at UCSF today. But my son, who's 11, will be reap that harvest, right? And so the two things, we have to be patient and we have to allow uneven rewards to occur for the whole engine to turn. Do we want the engine to turn? Yes, because God, we, we're not developing antibiotics. We want antibiotics. Uh, and it can't happen in a, in a public, there's no public <coughs> entity that can replace the economic incentives. You're freaking me out. So <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm good a, on a I'm going to stockpile <laughs> vaccines <laughs> and, and antibiotics. So straightforward question. Where are the next generation vaccines and antibiotics going to come from? If they're not coming from the U.S., are they going to come from other parts of the world? No. Nowhere? The rest of the world is largely, forgive me for saying this, a free rider on the U.S. innovation ecosystem for the life sciences. And so, so Germany says, oh, we won't pay those high prices. We want the U.S. patients and taxpayers to subsidize the innovation that we're going to get in Germany. Right. And Eventually, the United States is going to say, I'm sorry, we, we just we refuse to contain the bill. We'll put a tariff on that, won't we? We'll What's put that? a tariff on that. <laughs> we, 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 and we will barely know this. I used to Hopefully think there would be an equilibrium. Them. So, where are they, so where are they going to come from? I used to this think there would be an equilibrium. Story. That they, we would all sit around and go, oh my goodness, why are we having any innovations in vaccines? Where are the vaccines? But we don't ever have that conversation. That dog that doesn't bark. Those things that don't happen don't have a constituency. And so when, you know, but now I'll, I'll really get myself in trouble. When we enforce price controls on drugs in the United States, which is not an if but when question and a how much question, the pharmaceutical industry will downsize dramatically. And our level of risk that we will tolerate for low probability drugs. The probability that it, everyone knows these things is that a drug entering phase one will reach the marketplace is currently it's about seven or eight percent for a small molecule, about fifteen percent for a large molecule. And if you look across indications in oncology, it's argued that it's like three percent of the drugs entering clinical trials make it through. So that is a terrible lottery ticket to buy. But fortunately, the economics incentives are there. When they go away, we'll just wonder, hmm, I, guess, I guess cancer was a harder problem because I haven't seen many new drugs in a long time. So, so just to clarify, so your point about the no new antibiotics and the uh, no new vaccines being from a lack of incentive. So what actually happened? In other words, the, the, was there a particular government bill or, or what, what is the, the lever there that occurred? Some of these oh. are subtle. Like in the medical devices, we didn't come in and price control medical devices. We price control hospitals. We put DRGs. We said, OK, we're only going to pay you $75,000 for that heart surgery, and you've got to figure out how you get it. And so then the hospital said, geez, doctor, I don't really want you to buy that new expensive tool. And 
U.S. it recruits more patients to our hospital, unless you forgive me, or a Da Vinci that you can put on the website. But if it's just like a tool, it's expensive, but it makes the surgeons you know, better, faster, cheaper, the hospitals stop paying for it. And so now the medical device industry is dead. You cannot get venture capitalists to invest in medical devices. It just quietly went away. And none of us are sitting around talking about, what can we do to get medical devices back? And so vaccines were a public health issue because vaccines are the cheapest and best way. I'll give you something today, and 20 years from now, you won't get sick. Wow, what a wonderful thing. We have to put those into every kid. How can we do that? We can either raise a ton of taxes to pay for that, or we can tell you how much you can charge for it. And we chose the latter path, largely. But, so HPV vaccine seems, is that a counterexample, perhaps? Yeah, and, it's, and there's uh, RSV. Uh, there's also cancer. Yeah. Okay. HPV, right. cancer. Right. Yeah. Is that the cervical one? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. We do have one company in our incubator family that's developing an RSV vaccine as well. And there is an RSV vaccine that's come to market. And it's very expensive. And it was an experiment by the industry. Can we start making money in vaccines again? And I don't think it's been successful yet. But and coming back. To antibiotics. But again, it's a cost benefit analysis about what respiratory syncytial virus costs us in terms of sequelae and health outcomes. Yeah. But then, is that a, are we making a rational choice around what we're willing to pay for it and what those outcomes cost? Yes. You, I mean, I don't know that we're making a rational choice, but we're making a choice. A choice, yes, okay. And I think Zika virus uh, you know, or malaria, there, there is a vaccine development for that. And, yeah. and malaria vaccine is now available, but it's available in small aliquots and only for certain areas and only right. for certain high risk populations. <clears throat> Now that was driven by a nonprofit, by the DDD Correct. and all that. Uh, and so there, you can imagine, but boy, those are small They're by comparison. Yeah, so small by comparison to the number of needs. And I will say one thing that uh, we haven't mentioned yet in support of the venture capital industry, as if they need support, is that the, one of the very first questions of venture capitalists will ask is, how big is the unmet medical need? If the unmet medical need is small. Ain't invested. It's got to be a big capacitance gap there. So that is a driver that is you know, unmeasured. Well, it has, there, there has to be a big need, but there also has to be the capacity to pay. To pay, yes. I, that's why in my question is yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, they don't pursue anti malarials for that reason. Well, but yeah. perhaps philanthropy, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates, well, yeah, the Gates Foundation. Right. That will step up for those small, isolated, Correct. finite problems. Correct. Or some of these are also because these are problems in the developing world. So malaria, HIV, needs for vaccines there, where these are low-resource countries. So the uh, philanthropists, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, could provide funding for that, but it, it hasn't really been from uh, venture capital. So I've got five friends in the last 18 months who've died of superbugs in hospitals, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and they were basically, told, their family was told, you know what, they, they, no antibiotics work at all. So it sounds to me like Doug brought an 800 pound or an 8,000 pound gorilla into the room, which is that when he, when he says that there's no money for the development of antibiotics to the next generation, that sounds to me in plain English like people are going to die. And it could be some of us in this room. People are going to die because no one's stepping up to the plate. So I don't blame the venture capitalists for not stepping up to the plate, but you have federal, you have state, you have venture, you know, there's money from many sources. And then, of course, we don't necessarily have to raise taxes. We could change the budgetary and financial orientation of the United States away from areas that we might not like to areas that we might like. We could divert funds. So, who do you think, Doug, we're both, who do you think is going to step up to the plate to develop antibiotics to save the lives of all of us in this room? Because I'm concerned. See, that okay. scares me now. I'm, my outlook and I'm not is, alone. <laughs> my outlook isn't as grim as Doug's. I just pointed out to him that he's you know? got a company within his portfolio that is working on antibiotics. Oh, he is? Um, and I think that you know, there's a number of faculty at UCSF work on antibiotics. We hear this, we've heard this for the past 20 years, that antibiotics are no longer in vogue, that 
uh, venture capital investors won't invest in antibiotic companies. And then every three or four years, you hear about a remarkable outcome. Yeah. You know, some company is sold for, you know, two and a half billion dollars as an antibiotic. So I don't think it's as grim. I, I think that there are people still working on them, particularly for the resistant strains for which there's currently no effective, uh, effective yeah. cure. But I, I would, if I may, let me throw something in here from left field that has nothing to do with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, has nothing to do with healthcare. It comes to a point that Doug made at the outset about one of the principles that guides his investment uh, at, uh, at, at his venture firm um, that's important to his LPs uh, as well as just to the other members of his portfolio, and that is kind of the ethical considerations or the investments that he's making um, you know, good for society, okay? And you know, there, there's two examples of technologies that immediately come to mind that I've been really impressed by over the past month or two. One of which, unfortunately, you had nothing to do with, but it is this, you know, fake beef, um, the Impossible Burger, okay, yeah. that uh, orig originally was invented in a lab at Stanford and spun out into a, what's turning out to be a very, very successful company. When you think of the benefit to the world, if that eventually can be industrialized at a commercial scale, you know, think of, you know, the, the benefit in terms of reduced methane from all of the cattle that are currently raised and slaughtered to provide the beef, you know, to feed the developed world. But the other example, and you were an investor in this, is this company Bolt Threads, who makes synthetic silk, okay? Now, I heard the, uh, in a conversation six or nine or 10 months ago that although all the plastic bags that are ingested by whales create incredible photographs that you can see uh, on the internet, that the, uh, the far more insidious type of plastic uh, pollution comes from the washing of acrylic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our, da our fleeces that we wear, and every two weeks you throw them in the washing machine, you, you don't really notice until you've washed it a hundred times that it's a little thinner than it was when it was new off the rack. Well, it's all those microparticles of plastic that are being washed off the fleece that are being you know, put out ultimately into the ocean that all these little filter feeders, which you know the marine mammals and the larger organisms in the ocean are dependent <coughs> upon for the food chain, they're the ones that are all gonna suffer at the end of the day by these microparticles of acrylic. And so you have a company yeah. bulk who's making synthetic spider silk that can be woven into virtually yeah. any texture you can imagine. It's totally natural protein, okay, totally biodegradable. And to me, I don't know when Bolt was founded, whether the founders were thinking, okay, we're gonna have this huge societal benefit of making this synthetic or this you know, synthetic spider silk. But it's turning out to be that way. Right. And so when I think of you know, efforts to make um, artificial beef, uh, to make artificial, well, actually natural fibers that aren't plastic. Those are two uh, contributions to society that I think are wildly important, for which I think there's gonna be huge benefit and which check all of the ethical boxes yeah. that, that I would certainly need to check off. I was going to say, and we're going to open the floor up for questions in a moment, but just on the, the superbug issue, I think one problem is education of physicians. So when new antibiotics come out, uh, physicians often prescribe them too wildly or too broadly, <laughs> and that's partly why uh, uh, you end up with resistant strains to whatever we had as the defense. Now, part of that then is, I have to say, often pharmaceutical companies will advertise rather than prescribe the generic penicillin that you know, use the new super antibiotic uh, and uh, so it gets more profitable but then that leads to in fact a shorter usefulness of the new antibiotic and the need to create new ones in the existence of superbugs. So I think um, uh, th there's a whole uh, conversation about sort of the ecology in which new um, uh, treatments are sort of introduced in terms of you know how they get out to people. Sometimes there are great things that don't get out because of limited education of physicians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Uh, anyway, I thought we'd open up the panel uh, to uh, questions. So uh, the floor is open. Uh, so, yes. Hi, I'm Jane Lombard. I think I met you all. Uh, so I'm a cardiologist. I've been, I've been practicing for over 30 years, and I practice in many different projects, including Kaiser. And uh, I work just with the Tala Medical Foundation. So I think there are two issues um, that the venture capitalist and then also um, Dr. Kilpatrick sort of look at sort of different perspectives. One, you're looking at population health. And it drives me crazy that, yes, we are the richest country in the world, but we have you know, health, we don't have health insurance for all. And, and, you know, our young people, you know, I mean, you know, fortunately in California, we have colored California, but my son who's living in Florida, I still carry him because they have, quote, Obamacare, but it's crappy and he can't, nobody would take it. So basically he's a healthy 28 year old, but he'll get no care. Fortunately, he hasn't gotten sick yet, but he's going to move back to California. So that's number one. But the other thing is our system is broken. I get paid to put in pacemakers and put it through cats and everything. I don't get paid anything to tell people to lose weight and stop smoking. Mm-hmm. I finally convinced this guy to lose 60 pounds, um, and he had seen everybody, but I sent him to jump start. I gave up. And then, you know, mm-hmm. we took him off his six antihypertensives. He says, oh, my God, Doc, you know, I'm... All along, I thought I was depressed and I had low T syndrome. I was just fat. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's like, why don't we have something? Why doesn't insurance cover that? I'm not getting paid to get people to stop smoking, lose weight, and exercise, right? And then the other thing, going back to what you, you were saying, is you guys know about the Finnish experiment? Or data blockers? No, no, no. no. The, Finnish, the, the great Finnish public health experiment in the 19... 70s, the average lifespan of a Finnish man was 58 or so. In um, in like 25 years, <coughs> now 78, they have the longest lifespan. So you're talking you're talking about quality of life, right? And it was they have national health care. They didn't make more drugs. They didn't they didn't hire more doctors. But everywhere you go in Finland, there's like all this public health campaign to get people to stop smoking, exercise more. The bad thing was they drink a lot, right? Sure. So, you know, you have to get, like, your quota of alcohol. So the bad thing is all the Finns run off to Estonia to buy more alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but then it made it, it harder. And I remember 25 years ago when um, my fellow cardiologist at Kaiser Richmond was trying to put the soda tax on. He was booed out of every city council, but now we have a soda tax. So I think you can have a lot of impact with systems changes, and I agree with you that you need to have, you know, some sort of incentive for people to continue investing and creating new products. And it's tricky how you get both into the same system. So I don't know. Anybody want to try to answer that, or maybe we should have two systems? Well, having these conversations, yeah, I think, is the start. So to having the different perspectives, sitting around talking with nice people like you about the issues, I think is a, is, is a step in the right direction. I've heard no negative, I've heard no pushback from UCSF, and I, it sounds to me, agree, or, that you want to see society become healthier, you, UCSF's goal is to improve health. So I don't think there's a conflict at that, at that <coughs> level. I think it's more of a systemic, it's how society's structured and probably politi- politically, and I don't mean one party versus the other, I simply mean the political yeah, the structure, the system. Yeah, system that you operate in. Yeah, no, we're on, on the same page. I mean, bear in mind that many of the patients that come to UCSF uh, are not on private insurers, okay? <laughs> and so, as you said earlier, um, if you are on a, a Medi-Cal plan or something, there's a cap that Medi-Cal will pay to reimburse for a certain procedure. And so, UCSF has got no incentive to keep patients in the hospital longer to make more money off of them, because they're not. Um, they're actually incentivized to develop the highest quality health care to get patients out faster uh, and reduce the overall costs. But I'm, I'm thinking about why even admit them to the hospital at all, right? So if you get you know, rid of the old Confucian, you know, um, saying that the best doctor is the one who you know, doesn't have any patients, right? Because mm. you well, what, lost 60 in, pounds in, you don't have In, in, in the past anymore. 25, 30 years, what has been the, what's had the biggest impact on reducing cancer rates in the U.S. Ending cigarette smoking. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It took a long time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question online. Samir? Yeah. 
I think the place where it comes in is where um, the financial incentives and the public need are largely, not the public need, boom, but the patient need, unmet patient needs are largely consonant. So I don't think, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think it's something, I don't think they <coughs> worry about it, nor do I think they should worry about it. Can so I, push, can I yeah. push back on that for a minute? Please. Um, so as someone who, if you're having an incubator and you're evaluating different companies, um, if you're developing a healthcare algorithm, for example, um, do you counsel them or do you take into account what the ethical implications might be of whether there's interpreter bias, whether there's algorithm bias, um, what the use will be? Um, let's stretch it out and look at the, the consequences of what that algorithm will be for them to be applicable to that patient 10 years from now for their insurance, for them to be insured. Um, there's no such thing as de-identifying data. There is, it makes us feel good, but in reality, we really can't fully de-identify right. data, and we know that. So where are you, as a counselor, and as someone as a VC, investing in these companies? How are you advising them? Who are you using? to advise them, and, and how often do they think about these problems? So, so this may seem like a cop out here, but we don't do any digital health. That's not my universe. <laughs> I'm only about wet stuff. And the wet stuff, 90% of the stuff that we is, is in the most highly regulated uh, space in the planet. Remember, not only can we not sell anything without prior approval, we can't tell the world anything about it without prior approval. So we. We can never cause harm that is not uh, <coughs> inadvertent because there's been a ton of people who are checking that independently, yeah. right? So that's that's mostly where we are. There's a small set of what we do that's consumer oriented. So we were the home of Ripple Foods, a non-dairy milk product that, within you know, three years of being in our shop, it was on every shelf in the United States. That would be the most unregulated place we are is in food. Uh, Though ironically, if you want to build uh, products for agriculture, you are inspected beforehand with the GMP, you're inspected after only on a spot basis. So we're very concerned with plant health. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think, um, you know, let's just get, you know, what is the real, what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? We get entrepreneurs in who, I want, to who want to tackle intractable tumors like pancreatic cancer, right? Just unstoppable tumors like that, who say, I have a thesis. It may not work. I need to hundreds of millions of dollars to really know whether it's going to work or not. That's what we're working on. And where's the ethical challenge in that? I can't see one. So, so, so uh, let me just follow up and then we'll take your question. So, Barry, the digital health part of that? I mean, yeah, is that like more of a concern? More, yeah. Right. That seems like it'd be more. Well, no. It is. You you hit the nail on the head. I had a conversation with someone earlier today. You can get, you know, a million patient records de-identified, and as soon as someone takes one of those records and traces it back to the original patient, that's what you're going to read about in the Wall Street Journal. So, it is very very difficult to de-identify data. So, you know, another approach that is being actively pursued is to create uh, what's called synthetic data. And so that's a big area of interest uh, within several of our faculty. Um, and that completely um, avoids the potential of being able to trace it back to the original patient. All right, so we're going to go uh, this woman, yes. So I was going to sort of respond to a not into venture business, but sort of like the funded will acquire companies who come from venture. The yeah, the Did everyone hear her, by the way? <coughs> so speak no. up. If you're yeah, so I'm sort of the next level above the companies that get then, then get acquired, and you know there are some companies that are very good. There are other companies that are more challenging, where you can't trust the data that they've used. Uh, the data um, we have to we evaluate it. We depends on the metric. We do a lot of cleanup when we acquire. 
some of these types of games. Um, because uh, they're stage that some of them are in, and I can't speak for all of the companies, are in a very different space. They're not they're not really before the regulatory authorities, they're doing mm -hmm. the technical stuff. Um, and then we take on that responsibility and run in, you know, like clean up a, a lot of these issues to try to resolve them. So we were subject to a greater regulatory authority around the world today. So Arthur and then a question in the back. Yeah, okay, so I'm coming from a social and political philosophy perspective, and a couple of things very quickly. Uh, if people could turn off their phones, that would be oh great. Yeah. Uh, Adam Smith, the great exponent of a competitive marketplace, was not a fool. He, he had passages on how the market will fail, and we heard examples. He was very happy to see people motivated by profit, doing things for their own sake, but working out for the public good. Right? He was actually coming from an uh, emphasis on sympathy and the public good. He wasn't saying you know, Ayn Rand-like, it's all about you know, the survival of the fittest or the greediest. Right? And he thought it was all going to be quasi, basically quasi-utilitarian, but he recognized failures, limitations, and so forth, like you can't get vaccines because it's not profitable enough. Other economists subs more, in more recent, well, maybe Milton Friedman and others won Nobel Prizes in economics carefully analyzing mathematically market failure. And, the gov and so that's one thing. Number two, exponents of private property and private accumulation of wealth, like Robert Nozick, said one of the arguments for, let, for having a system where some people get a lot of money is that they can invest in things and lose that money and not care, not be bothered about it. And they can be motivated by, they've got all the money, they can be motivated by something nobler and higher as some of the great, uh, well, the, Gates and others, right? They have so much. This model is very perverse. You're telling me they're not, not going to do it because there isn't a lot of money to be made. Well, the theory was they're supposed to have so much money that they don't care about making a lot of money. They care about becoming honored and admired. So there's something wrong with the culture that the people with a lot, and we see that in politics too, people with a lot of money seem to want more money. Mm -hmm. You know, what do they need more money for? They have $20 billion, they have $80 billion. They should be investing money in stuff, most of which will lose money. This, it doesn't matter to them, but what might matter is they'll go down in history as the person who funded something that uh, Dr. Kilpatrick is talking about, right? So also there are perverse incentives and disincentives, also, also studied by social psychologists as well as economists. So when you're not getting paid for counseling your patient about sound nutrition and exercise, there's a positive externality, something really good that, you're, that it, it is not being accounted for in the accounting, right? And when they make those sweaters, that wind up degrading the oceans, there's a, there's a negative externality that's not being accounted for. So the marketplace is a very imperfect instrument, and private incentive is sometimes great and sometimes uh, skewed and perverse. So we really need a good economist here, too, who can take yeah. over my point. All right, okay. But I think that I, I basically what I'm Are saying Are you volunteering? Is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not only a humble the fact is that um, yeah. the government has, in fact, the railroads, uh, the development of farmland, mm -hmm. the public university systems, mm -hmm. the internet, and a uh, the, the conquering of yellow fever by Dr. Reed's, not him, as much, but his team, mm -hmm. Jonas Salk. He did it. He gave it away. There's plenty of room in human nature for great achievements that do what Dr. Kilpatrick is talking about, and there's room for people who are mostly thinking of themselves and their money, provided we can control the system, we can modulate the system to get the best out of them and not let things get skewed. That's what I want to say for now. Comments? Well, I have a comment, which is that uh, it's kind of anecdotal, but it's related to that. So I, I was at Cambridge University for 10 years, and uh, I used the National Health Service, you know, once in a while. And I know Patrick Maxwell, professor who's the head of the clinical school at, at Cambridge, and, and talked to him recently. And there's a standing joke in the UK, which is not a perfect system. In fact, there's no perfect healthcare system, but they're at about number eight in the WHO, and we're about 29. And, this, and the joke is, it's actually not a joke, but it's kind of sad. In the UK, they say, you know, in, uh, in the UK, you go into a hospital or a clinic, and the first question they ask you is, where does it hurt? And you go into the similar institution in the United States and they ask, who's your insurance? Mm -hmm. and, and, and whenever I go to the doctor's office for anything, who's your insurance? Mm -hmm. No one ever asks me at all, like, where does it hurt? So I, 
I think that there's a there's a paradigm there, and I, I really want you to think about that, which is that um, where does it hurt? There's a title of a film, or Michael Moore maybe. <laughs> where does it hurt is more important than whose pain. And, you know, at a time when we stick my neck out, in a time when we're contemplating building walls and sending fleets to the South China Sea, it, it, is, it is a question of political priorities. And I say, always side with the American people. And, I'm, and, I'm, not, and I'm not running for president. <laughs> <laughs> should run for president. But if I did, I think I might win. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> question, gentlemen in the back. And we would get you more funding. <laughs> so vote for, I'll me. for you. Right, right, right. More funding for UCSF. <laughs> My question is about UCSF and ethics. I went to a um, pitch night for in April for UCSF's Entrepreneurship Center, and the winner of the pitch um, proposed a drug that was going to cost eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And there was not a word from either the venture capitalist or anyone from UCSF about the cost of that drug. And I thought to myself, UCSF ought to get out of the entrepreneurship business if they don't interject a discussion about ethics when someone proposes an $850,000 drug. Is that a question? Or <laughs> you, you, if it's a question, question about ethics and UCSF. you can well, well, comment. Let's, let, let's ask the person who's actually responsible for the entrepreneurship center. She's sitting in the back row there. She just took a big bite of chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe, I have a bite of chicken, I can't talk. Maybe, Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> maybe Stephanie Maris can talk about the extent to which she factors ethics into you know, her, the course that she teaches and the companies that pitch during pitch night. Well, that would be Can you speak louder? So, In the so, so put it back to some of the earlier comments. If there's no economic incentive to develop something because you're never going to make any money out of it, then there won't be any new cure, as you hear from the cure, for a lot of diseases. So it's, it's well accepted in the gene therapy sector that you have to charge a lot of money because that's the only way you'll recruit your expenses and be able to actually make a return for your investment. That's an Yeah, but uh, I don't mean to get into the debate, but let's be precise. In that case that we're talking about, their argument wasn't about the cost of development. It was about what the alternative costs are and how they can price based on the alternative costs. Yeah, and, and that is a strategy that's broadly followed in the industry because you're going to replace something um, with the alternative cost. And if you can do it cost effectively and provide patient benefit, that's the main part. What I hear from you is an ethic, there's not an ethical argument that the ACSF should be making, there's an economic argument. I'm making an economic argument, I'm just charging companies. Yeah, but that's not But what if the drug doesn't get developed at all? Who's the, who, what's the voice of that uh, constituency in that discussion? Mm -hmm. So again, my, my question, and again, this is, I don't mean this to be a debate, but my question is, um, should an institution like UCSF interject into a discussion like that, an ethical component to the discussion? So, oh, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I kind of come back to a point that uh, Doug made. I mean, you know, the market really determines what uh, a drug costs, okay? Um, and whether a drug costs eight thousand, eighty thousand, or eight hundred thousand um, dollars, if the alternative is that you don't develop it at all, and what I assume, I wasn't actually at the pitch night, but what I assume is that it's probably for a relatively rare indication, for which the patient population isn't large, and so in order to justify the risk and the cost associated with getting a drug like that approved through the FDA. Eight hundred thousand must have been uh, a cost that would have uh, justified VC investors backing that company. And if there wasn't enough of an upside, then the VC investors would never have funded it in the first place. 
and the resultant therapy would never see the light of day. So an another example, I mean, don't forget, when Gilead launched Parvoni for the cure of hepatitis, they were roundly criticized for the price. But that was a cure. Okay, it wasn't like a lifetime chronic medication that you took and your insurance company paid you know, $50,000, $100,000 a year uh, to cover the cost of that. It was a cure. And so while, yeah, Gilead enjoyed you know, a nice spike in their revenues and John Martin was able to um, retire at the peak of Gilead valuation, mm -hmm. as soon as they started curing the majority of patients, now all of a sudden their sales dropped off. So, you know, so, so, you got to take that into consideration. So, so I would say that ethically, I think these are obviously the pricing of drugs and should there be a maximum price is a very large conversation. And obviously, this is one that I think, as Doug mentioned, is inevitable that there may that that um, Congress on I think both sides of the aisle has at least said that they want to address. And I think part of the problem is that the current model, I would argue, from a public health point of view is ultimately not sustainable. So we just had a few days ago, I think on Monday, the FDA approved the treatment for spinal muscular dystrophy or spinal muscular atrophy for $2.1 million per patient. And um, I think that I would hypothesize that it might be possible to have a cost that's lower than $2 million that would still allow the drug to be made. In other words, Yes, there needs to be a certain amount of profit. There needs to be a certain amount of return on investment. Does that mean it's going to be two million, one million, eight hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, fifty thousand? And you know, so I think that it could be. One would hope there could be a win-win. And I think that uh, you know, from an ethical point of view, I think. You want to look at the benefit. You want to look what are risks. You want to look at rights of people. But I, I would argue that the notion of uh, the the inequities, both within our society and more globally between quote the haves and the have-nots, that the inequity is increasing, and that I think from an ethical point of view, that's something that we as a society need to think about. Now it could be that uh, you know we have you know, quote, better Obamacare or Obamacare 2.0 or whatever that may look like. But I think the, I think as a society, these are issues that we need to address. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, venture capital must do X as a result, but I think within the ecosystem, I think, you know, the, the voice of the, 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 the will of the people is beginning to speak. Right, but it's really, the drugs are 12% of that, of the healthcare spend, right? So, so we cut it in half, right? We haven't done much to solve the problem. And so it is the most, um, it is the easiest target to pick on. Why is it? Why is the University of California underfunded by the state? And why is the healthcare problem the problem it is? It's because these are the only two major sectors of our economy that haven't enjoyed productivity increases. It costs us more to deliver, on a real dollar term, deliver education to people today than it did 50 years ago. And the state hasn't kept pace with that mm -hmm. increasing efficiency. The same is true in healthcare. And I totally agree with you. And um, we need to change habits. Most of the healthcare problems you're describing are the product of a lifetime of bad decisions. We should start in elementary school. And it's not no. Um, Universal health care is not going to make us make better decisions about our diet, smoking, exercise, drug addiction. You know, in this country this year, more people will die from opioids than they will from breast cancer. And yet, we have very little activity in solving that problem, right? So we have almost no drug discovery and development efforts on that side, no yeah. So actually, let's, there's a few other questions. So I'm going to. I was just going to respond to the opioid thing, but that's also because of the lack of ethics and the regulation. And you know, having been in medicine for so long, because I'm so old, you know, you just see how like the detailing. You know, a lot of people it's like, you don't need to spend this much money on this drug because you really, it's not an appropriate one. It's a Fair cheaper enough. drug, right? And the, I think the the pharma detailing. Um, and then pitching directly to, to patients, I noticed a huge change in how 
you know, and, and that also, I think that had a huge impact on the opioid crisis. All right, so well, it's, it's not <laughs> yeah. just that you okay. think that. That's been documented from internal emails from those companies where sales reps were getting paid bonuses by convincing doctors to prescribe right. higher right. dosages yeah. than the patients actually needed. Well, that's needed. an ethics issue. That's an ethics well, that's issue. a legal no, issue. Yeah. 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 There's no legal question about that. that. Yeah. Right. No question. True. So, so let me just come back to that. So <clears throat> Purdue, you mentioned Purdue, Theranos. Are there any lessons there that 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 venture capital or should or uh, or others should should learn. Well, I, I, we can't have system. Well, yes, I would be really. We we can't have investment systems without terrible failures, and we're going to have uh, debacles of this sort over and over again throughout history. It, um, the thesis that Theranos was founded on is one we all embrace, mm -hmm. and which is wow, a cheap, painless test that could proactively define all sorts of potential illnesses, great. She failed to execute on that, and she <clears> lied <throat> to patients and investors along the way. That's, that's not an industry problem. That's a boom. It's a, it's a, it's a cancer, a, a local tumor within our industry. So yeah. I think we have, to, uh, we have to be tolerant of failure as well. Okay. What's so, the responsibility? So, so let, let, Correct. Let, let's I have. I hardly say we're we're sin free and making bad investments. <laughs> we make plenty of bad investments. All right. So yeah. let's no take your question and then Mimi's parents. and then we'll go around. So, yeah. do you just want to introduce yourself and say what you make your comment? Yeah. So, uh, so Dave Chang, I've been in biotech DC for about nine years. Um, yeah, the comment was just, uh, you know, I, I get asked about bad blood and fairness all the time. To my understanding, no actual life science venture capitalists invested. Right, and the reason I paused there is I would not say that we're so crescent and smart in yeah. the life science VC space that we couldn't have invested in something of that ilk and have routinely invested in things that blow it up on us. Right. I know, and I'm just saying that you know we have to we have to be tolerant of failure. Right. But I think the question here is not so much about a you know people investing in company that we love. This, this happens all the time. This was an issue of how did you all invest in a company that lied to everybody so massively and yeah. kept that lie going with for so a lot long. of money? Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> and in the case of the biotech VCs, they do what they do on a basic basis every day. Ask, how does this work? Let me see the data. And yeah, but they say, yeah. I don't let you see the data. Does that want you to invest? Yeah. Does not fly with any life science investor. No. But I so you get the Walgreens of the world. But I mean, look at Cerna. I mean, here we have a company that was acquired by Merck for what, one point three billion dollars. I understand <coughs> nothing but ashes remained of that whole enterprise. So we have to be. It's it's hard. And now this was different because it was fraud, right? But at the foundation of this, the capacitance gap was a real problem of trying to solve, it. and. Anyway, so it's a, it, the, um, the Theranos case is really uh, an outlier, you know, in, in industry in general. I mean, very few companies of that ill occur, thank God, but they can occur. Yeah, but I think your point is, is correct. There's smart money, okay, that, you know, typical biotech VC investors are by and large smart investors, and unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for those of us who were biotech investors, that wasn't the type of investor that backed Theranos. Yeah. So Mimi? So uh, do you think, and this is for you, Dr. Harper, um, do you think that there is room in the VC biotech investing world, um, and maybe this is a question for you as well, for ethical, for third party, independent, non fiduciary non-investor, interested parties to help you evaluate companies, not just from a medical scientific standpoint, because I, I am local here, I'm an MD, PhD, I've been at UCSF on faculty, I work in biotech where we develop a gene therapy, um, where not just the medical scientific understanding that this is truly a good scientific, high integrity science project, 
but an ethical analysis of things that VCs and all this money that <coughs> investment so that you don't, don't get caught up in a case like Theranos that's going to blow up. Well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't have tripped up ethical wire, right? You wouldn't have known that. That would have tripped the scientific medical wire and that there are many right. people that examined that. But, but similarly or analogously, there may be aspects of the technology being developed that is super powerful to create a positive effect. But because the potential ROI is so great that the people involved may be blinded to really investigating under every rock and corner how this may be inadvertently leverage to do something nefarious. Is there room in the VC biotech investing world for that third party independent ethical analysis of those institutions? So, sort of like a I consulting company. That, that wire was not the ethical wire there and the research mistake wire there are the same wire. The, you know, the false data is an ethical issue. For the, for, for the firm, but let's say and uh, we're in the room together and they're pitching us. We want to take a drop of blood and diagnose all this stuff. And we go, wow, that's a cool idea. We invest. There was, it was no, there was no technology there when she did that. She just said, this is a principle I'd like to pursue. Give me a lot of money. And people did. Is there an ethical problem to any of that conversation? No. She proved, uh, she proved to be a bad actor who lied. To so patients and yeah, and I think that's a different example. So if you if you look at platforms, for example, gene therapy, yeah. and you you know there are a lot of untoward ways that gene therapy, whether it's a gene transfer gene therapy or gene editing gene therapies, there are any very many untoward ways that that technology that platform can be leveraged to do things that maybe we as a society for humanity don't <coughs> want to go. But for the VCs, I understand the ROI could be extremely rich. Yeah. However, is there room for a third party <coughs> ethical analysis of that scenario so that the VCs are not blinded five years later, like, for example, a Purdue or a Sackler family, that they can be warned, OK, you, a priori, if you're going to go in and invest in this and grow this company and make it come to fruition for your investors, these are the guardrails from an ethical standpoint that you should consider putting in place before it's too late and you're reactively <coughs> going to have to respond to. So this was exactly why we created, this is why I'm sitting up here, is we said, we will give, we will think about this enough to be able to report on every investment what we think those intended and unintended consequences could be. And do you have ethically trained um, ethicists who are, who are able to, with the uh, I'm, I'm a font of ethical vision. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny about that? Oh, my goodness, no. But someone, like you, it's arguable, you have a conflict of interest, right? right. You have a fiduciary duty to yeah. those that are investing, right. so you're yeah. conflicted out. Yeah, you can't be You have an independent... I was just being facetious. <laughs> right. But I'm... All right, let me... Yeah, so I... We'll so let the, him the, the parties that were interested offered those services when we thought they were appropriate to us, and we will call upon them when we think that insight would be useful. I take it, though, that you're asking whether that would be appropriate to impose on investors. Yes, as a, because <laughs> investors, are, investors have a goal. They have a job, yeah. and that goal is conflicted with something that may diminish their ROI. Uh -huh. so, so can I, um, I mean, it's, I don't know that we can point, yeah, go ahead, you're trying to tell me to shut up. Well, <laughs> yeah. I think you're envisioning a hypothetical that we haven't really encountered. Exactly. I'm not aware, I mean, I'm sitting here racking my brain trying to think of yeah, a please. company that was backed by credible VC investors who violated what any of us would consider kind of strong ethical norms. So I'll, I'll okay. come up with one, for example, Health Tap. Let's look at Health Tap. Um, what is Health Tap? Health Tap, oh, they're based in Palo Alto, and they're a platform for telemedicine. They're one of the first early ones. Yes. And they've been quite, quite successful. Uh, and um, they're, the betting for the submissions on that, and I know because I've done this, it takes about 25 seconds. 
uh, to enroll as a physician. And so the quality and the standard of care being delivered to the consumers who are willing to pay for the membership to do that, and the physicians who are able to build their personal brand as a doctor, is there. And the consumers are willing, so the market, the business, the ROI, and the VPs that invested, I mean, this thing bloomed incredibly. But what really, what unmet medical need was that addressing? And who evaluated that? But did it, did that it blow really up? Blossomed? Did it blow up because of these ethical it hasn't issues? It has blown up yet. Okay. Facebook, Facebook went for how long before it's really starting to blow up? And still, it, now it's so ubiquitous that it's hard to break down. So, yeah, so I think, I would say, I think that, um, I know that because we've been I've been approached, but there are drug companies doing is one major major one particular for instance doing phase three trials. But there's a lot of ethical questions that are unclear. So post trial access, compassionate use. You know, if you develop a drug, at what point should you give it to anyone who says, "Gee, that's going to help my baby. Give it to me." And how do you decide how much you charge? Should that be part of the trial? Um, you know, is there really equipoise between, you know, the new thing and, you know, do you pick a low comparator and make your drug look good? So I think, I, I know that it, there are large pharmaceutical companies that are, realize that they face ethical questions at the answer to which they're not clear and they often ask for input. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm less familiar with the, the VC space, which sounds like it may be compounds at a much earlier well, well, bear point. Well, if you're conducting a clinical trial in the U.S., okay, yeah. there's an IRB right. that basically monitors not only the safety uh, and the underlying rationale for conducting the trial, the potential benefit to the patients, they also take into consideration the ethical aspects of that. So if you have a, uh, a, a compassionate use patient that approaches you to be treated with a drug prior to its approval, that basically goes before a panel to review right. whether that's ethically sound to do that. Yes. So the, what's, what's growing is a lot of uh, companies realize that they have different choices, that the, the an IRB just says yay or nay or changes, so why are you doing that or that? Whereas so a lot of companies realize, you know, we can do, there's five different ways we can do this. We're going to pick one which would be the best that we then go to the IRB to get tweaked. But but you're right. I mean, there are and there are IRBs, but I think there's a sense that I, I know I know a lot of companies are realizing, at least these large pharma companies, that they need they, they would benefit from input on helping to think through various issues, et cetera. So we had a few other questions. This gentleman in the corner here, yes. Thank you. I and just introduce yourself. You know, uh, Todd Slady. I'm a former synthetic biologist, now a startup coach in biotech. And I get to interact with people such as yourselves a lot, and I understand the dynamics of venture capital is such a full nature of it. And I'm wondering, kind of to uh, emphasize your guys' and doctors of philosophy in particular, does the very nature of the cyclic, the cyclical nature of venture capital, you raise a fund, you spend it, you exit, you raise another fund, and you keep raising funds, how can that be mobilized for uh, a value-driven approach to investing instead of a growth-driven approach, which it is fundamentally? And Val because, you mean because value to patients or value? Well, <coughs> value in, in the kind of a financial returns aspect. So you're not looking for the big exit uh, and the chunk. To say. You're calculating the value of your investment by the long-term returns, right? Yeah. So just like you think of a value mutual fund or, or a growth fund, right? These things are fundamentally growth driven. Yeah. Is it possible to mobilize venture capital for things like health, which is a value driven proposition, never a growth driven? Are we forking up the wrong tree? Well, now you're now you're putting value in this other context. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're mixing the two. I'm, I'm trying not to, but please. In the first case, there are some funds that are evergreen funds that do not have are not you know ten-year closed-end funds. There are evergreen funds, um, and the biotech industry. I mean, one of the great innovations of, bio, of, of Genentech was how the hell do you get money? We need truckloads of money into this. How can we get a succession of investors at different stages of the company to bring those trucks? And so that's where public markets are not an exit, they're just a financing event, but they're a financing event that allows some early investors to sell their interest in the company. So we do have these, we do have long-term hold mechanisms. They just may, 
there may be some transition in the share ownership along the way. So what? I mean, the, the, the basic <coughs> philosophy in venture capital, okay, venture, is that you were hoping out of your 10 investments to get two or three blockbusters, okay, and you're willing to write off the other seven, you know, six or seven or seven or eight, um, because you're really counting on the blockbusters. But once those companies go public, the type of investors that are buying shares in those companies, they're not looking for that 10x or, or whatever, I mean, they'd love to get it. But a lot of those shareholders, if they can get a solid, you know, 2x, 2.5x, they're happy, okay? And if you can get a steady stream of those type of shareholders buying your stock over time, assuming you're building value, you can build a very successful company that's, that is more um, value-based, okay, as opposed to swinging for the fences and trying to get that 10x or 15x. So we're going to have we're going to stop in a few moments. We're just going to take uh, two more questions. Two, th well, maybe just uh, I will right, have people haven't asked a question before. We'll take, we'll, just, oh, no, 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 just just a moment because we have a lot of people have their hands up. So uh, we'll take two or three questions and then I'll let the panelists respond uh, uh, to that. So we're just going to go around question and then we'll hear two or three first. So Anne, did you have a question still? Um, so um, I've been a Kaiser physician for 22 years in high-risk obstetrics, so I really believe in the Kaiser model of um, focusing on health and doctors making decisions and not fee for service. Um, Can everyone hear? Bob and I went to medical school together, and one of our classmates is a VC, cardiologist VC, and um, he was saying to me, he's um, he wants more meaning out of his life, and he wants to move away from being a VC and focused on the return. And he's trying to think of a model where he could use his skills from VC, but work for the greater good and not for the, the 10x. And so I don't know where he is on that because he's not a guy. But um, I wanted to know if you had any, if you had some people who made, they're ready to retire, they don't care about making. Another 10 billion. And by the way, I have a real problem with um, saying it's okay to make so much money because then you're gonna you're gonna give it all of the bad daddy ups. How do how do why do they get to decide what is the project to give money to, and um, and how it's structured? I have a real problem with that. I don't know who should be making those decisions about where we invest those things, but. If you were going to say, you know, to someone who says, I want to leave my VC world, I want to do good, but I want to take my skills and knowledge, how should I do it? He should come work with me. He could be a poor, he could be a poor venture capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> He's already rich. But, well, but actually. It's really about what you're getting at is how do you, how do you. Look, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, you just described me, okay? <laughs> I was CEO of a public company. Uh -huh. I got a big fat bonus every year. I got new options every year. My base salary was almost double what I make at UCSF. But I realized after 15 years and turning over the cards, neither of which were positive, that I, I wanted more meaning for my life. So being able to come back to a public university like UCSF and positively impact many faculty, many students. I mean, that's what motivated me. But still, I mean, it seems like if there's no big return, <coughs> people are not going to, they're not going to get funded, right? What do you mean there's no big return? I mean, I the best model for VCs, if you're not going to make, a, if there's not potential to make a lot of money. Well, you, right? you go through phases in life where making a lot of money becomes less important because you've already paid off your mortgage. Your kids are out of college, and you can focus on doing the things that you really want to do. So I think that that helps. That's probably why you don't see a lot of young people unless, you know, they they got lucky at Google or Facebook or company like that, uh, going into these types of roles. But, you know, w with your particular example, if there's you know, if you know people who are kind of successful entrepreneurs or investors who want a higher quality of life, who want to come. I, you know, introduce them to people like us because I'm looking for entrepreneurs to take a lot of these great inventions that are coming out of the labs of our faculty at UCSF who are not going to leave UCSF to start 
and run companies, we need entrepreneurs to come and, and help do that, either do it themselves or to, to come on board and help recruit those new CEOs that will come in and build companies on those technologies. All right, so I have a comment yes, on that, which is I think, it's, I, think, I think what you're saying is it's a political question. And you may be unfamiliar with this quote, but John F. Kennedy said, uh, the, as far as, as the U.S. government's concerned, all the wealth in the United States belongs to the United States government. The government just decides how much people can keep. That's his quote, okay? So if, if the University of California has gone from free tuition for 100 years to 4 to 5 percent now supported by the state, Four. depending upon Benioff and these other people, Face, the, the Facebook people and the Benny up, they have so much money because they're allowed to have so much money. So I would suggest you consider the possibility of restructuring the tax code it, rather, than, rather than passing on this future debt to the young people in this audience. Again, I, I went almost for nothing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and that's not right. That's not right. So my generation has saddled you with this mess because of poor, in my view, poor political decision making, it is within the power of the federal government to decide how much they're going to let the Facebook people keep and how much the government's going to keep that then can be transferred to the University of California and reduce the, the student cost. So I don't want this just to be a scientific or technological or venture capitalist thing. It's a, in my view, it's just a political decision and everyone in this room has power not only to vote, but to write to your congressmen and women, you know, get involved. Get involved. If you want something to happen, as Gandhi said, be the future you want to see happen. Here, here. That's what I believe. All right, so, so we're, yeah. you're right, I'm voting for him. So we're going to have these three last comments, and then we're going to question. So Arjun, and then we'll, uh, this gentleman, this woman, then we'll have final thoughts. Yes. Um, I, I was uh, just jumping off what Dr. Kirkpatrick was saying earlier. Uh, there seems to be a, a little bit of concern around nationalizing some aspects of this and getting more government intervention. But I, I don't, I mean, what is, um, I think Dr. Crawford, you were saying something about <coughs> your objections to kind of nationalizing certain classes of drugs and maybe some government subsidies to maybe help with, uh, you know, tolerating failures um, and just, uh, you know, incentivizing prevention, things like that. I don't, I don't know why more government intervention, more government funding in that regard wouldn't be a good thing. So just to, so what I, uh, what I said is that developing drugs is a very expensive exercise that requires a lot of highly skilled people doing the same work over and over again. What I just said there is the exact mm -hmm. opposite of what the universities are good at. And so would you, those constraints in the university context would crowd out and destroy the things that we cherish about universities. And we do not have anywhere in the world any examples of institutions that have done that job as well as biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Okay, so that's, and then the disincentives, sectors that do not, uh, are not allowed to have egregious profits do not see the activity of development. We don't see drugs emerging in markets that we have <coughs> capped returns in. One of these, which is really interesting, is diagnostics. So there was a huge wave of investments in the uh, Valley in diagnostics companies starting in the mid-2000s. And one of the you know, seminal companies in that space, Genomic Health, said, why don't we price genotics uh, diagnostics in terms of the value we bring to the patient, which is how ultimately you judge drug pricing, is what value are you bringing to the patient. And they prosecuted a $3,500 uh, diagnostic for cancer. And they had at one point 55 members of their staff whose full-time job it was to argue with insurance companies over reimbursement. And it just was a it was, a, it, they bought, they succeeded, you could still order the Oncotype BX test, it's the company still there, it's a model that was broken, very few companies have followed them down that path, because we cap, we regulate the price we will pay for a diagnostic. So is citizen science going to come in 
and change the way we evaluate new drug development in some way, perhaps? Make well, it cheaper uh, and somehow get some guardrails going on it. It won't be the university way. It won't be the way we'd like to see it. But perhaps there's a happy medium. I mean, I don't know the answer, but I think that there's going to be the struggle. You're touching on a really important point, which hasn't come up. If we can find ways to increase the productivity of our sector, everyone will be happy. And I will brag about what we do. We, traditionally, if you and I wanted to start a biotech company, we would have begun <coughs> our life with a drive up and down Sand Hill Road. We would have tried to raise five or $10 million. The first two million of that and six to 12 months would have been spent finding space, buying equipment, getting permits. We now can allow the two of us to get data in the first week for 1500 bucks. And so that's profoundly changed who a third of our companies are women-led. Five of our seven exits from our funds have been women-led companies. Who gets to be a biotech executive? What gets to be a biotech project? We have seven aging companies in our shop right now. We have seven bi microbiome companies. Those are off the radar for pharmaceutical companies. So you democratize who and how you become a biotech company. Great. We get people all dressed up, and they run at this unbelievably expensive wall called the FDA. And we're none of us in this room are going to advocate for lowering the scrutiny, the time, the, that process. And so sure, OK, I, maybe I can get you to a clinical trial, not for 30 or 40 million dollars. Maybe we can get you there for 15 million dollars. We can get you to an IND for 15. I've done half the cost. Now we still have to come up with hundreds of millions of dollars necessary to go forward. All right, so I promised two people to ask last couple, but I, um, we're going to have refreshments here in the back. We hope you all hang around, and hopefully our speakers will have time to interact and answer more additional questions. So the gentleman here. When talking and just introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Charles. Can we get a final advisor? Yes, yes. When, uh, when talking to potential investors in a venture capital fund, um, is, there, is the sales pitch for ethics in biotech, you're going to sleep better at night? Or is it that <laughs> by being ethical, you're also going to have higher returns? In public markets, there is an argument that if the good people constrain themselves by avoiding certain types of investments, then the price for the shares of those unethical companies is lower, resulting in higher profits for the people who are willing to be unethical. And so I'm wondering, does that, do you also think that it works that way in private markets as well? And how do you think about that when talking to investors in your fund? Yeah, I just, um, I mean, I don't, I'm going to seem nothing but naive to my friend here, but our companies come to us, I mean, the five companies I'm looking at right now, four of them are going to cure, trying to cure cancers that are otherwise unaddressed. You know, and it, it's just, the, our investors come to us because they go, my God, investing in you, I get to go home and tell my family, my friends, I'm helping cure cancer. We're really doing something. I'm not building another app, <laughs> right? I'm really doing something. Our money will have a multiplicative value for society. And to say within that domain that there may be some that are ethically questionable, like say Caribou, which was a proud member of our portfolio, a company that Barry mentioned, which has got gene engineering capabilities that could end up in China in some bizarre uh, experiment. Uh, yes, that is so much smaller domain than if you were you know, shale oil or weapons manufacturers. We, I think we only have good guys on our team. So this woman here, you had a question. Yes, I did. Um, my question is very different from the others. I, I work in consumer goods and luxury, so it's super different. Um, there's a lot of companies now that are bridging health and other industries. There's a lot of, for example, health and beauty. There's a lot of supplements. Um, and you mentioned you were an investor in Ripple Foods, and there's like Ripple, and there's Oakley, and there's all of these um, uh, dairy replacing, supposedly better for you, healthy companies. How do you see that as a trend playing out in both the bioethics world, where you have these supplements, like you don't know if they're proven, but oh, they're so, like their marketing is so sexy, everybody's buying them, and people are investing in them too. Um, and then, yeah, the second question 
versus what other um, industries you see help expanding or crossing over the two? Well, I was impressed with the plastics, the, the artificial silk, yeah. with the artificial beef. I mean, things that are ostensibly not, quote, in health, mm -hmm. but obviously have huge health implications and also uh, Kaiser investing in housing, uh, yeah. you know, so the social social determinants of health are huge. So right. I think those are three examples that are outside health but affect health. So in the famous movie, which some of you saw and some of you may not have seen, called The Graduate, which was in the 60s, <laughs> and there's the, bar, there's the party scene and the guy yes, sneaks right. up to the young guy and he whispers <laughs> in his ear, plastics. And of course now we're, we're really, you know, reaping the whirlwind of that. So the word that I would, I would throw out in response, I think in all aspects of the economy, looking forward, the word's going to be sustainability. So I think we have uh, more or less reached the end of the line as a civilization to continue to produce single-use, you know, plastics. It's, forget it. I mean, and, and we had a talk at the Commonwealth Club, as, 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 as Barry said, it's not really just that there's this pile of trash in the Pacific the size of Rhode Island, the, mic the microplastic is now, there's not a, there's not a place in, on the planet, actually. The top of the Pyrenees, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, these microplastics, which, which come partly from these fleeces, by the way, this is cotton, but fleeces uh, and other sources, uh, it's irreversible, actually. So, I mean, we can stop, which we're not going to do, but we could stop. But the plastic, microplastic is going to be around for a long time. So I think the positive news is that, that people are aware of this. There will be more companies in, uh, in the field of, of, of clothing and transportation and food that are uh, sustainable. So I'd like you to think about that. If I, if I was an investor, I was an investor for 25 years, and I worked with most of the leading pharmaceutical companies and the VCs, and my job was to find, to find investments, and I found a lot of really good ones. I would put my money on sustainability. And a country like China, which has got to be, I've been there 20 times, one of the most polluted places I've ever been, if they have an incentive to clean it up, they have a big population, they want to, if they can dominate that world of sustainable products, I think they will try, and they can be good partners for us. So that's my contribution. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just have final comments? Uh, Starting with Doug, and what worked down? If you want to make any final comments, or well, I've said too much already. Yeah, uh, but uh, it was all <laughs> it was all great. We left, our, we left our guns at the door. Yeah. You're safe. You know, I think uh, uh, one of the things that I believe is that we are at an inflection point in the biosciences. Um, so uh, the industry is really. Uh, Young, it's only 40 years old, plus or minus, and uh, a lot of what we tried to do didn't work. Most of the investments we made were, uh, unfortunately, were not successful. Um, we built a lot of platform companies, a lot of technology companies that didn't produce products, but ended up being very interesting scientifically. And I think finally we are rounding the corner where we're beginning to see an increase in the re the probability that our research and our startups will produce drugs that will help the patients. And that will have, I think when we have this panel again in 50 years, because we'll all be taking drugs from these aging companies that will make us lively enough to come back in 50 years, we'll look back at this and say, oh my gosh, this was the dawn of the golden age of the biotech industry, where we can turn to biology to solve the world's problem. So I would be optimistic. That would be my Great. Hi. Um, what I would say is that ever since I was a bench scientist and I would meet someone for the first time and they would ask me what I do, I was always really proud because I think that what we do in terms of discovery and, you know, if we're lucky and skilled, developing therapeutics that benefit patients, I think it's noble. And I have yet to meet a management team in biotechnology who is, you know, one of their overriding principles uh, for running and managing the company that does not include integrity. Um, 
it's it's in the mission statement of every company that I've been familiar with, and I do think that as a as an industry, uh, we perform pretty spectacularly compared to many other industries when it comes to uh, integrity and ethics, and the companies that we focused on have been the outliers, the ones that have, you know, whether it's the Sackler family illegally uh, pushing the marketing of opioids or whether it's the Theranos founder and her enabler, um, those are the outliers. I think, you know, as an industry and in academia in general, what we do is noble. It's done with high ethics, and I'm really proud of what we do. Well said. So as a partner uh, for 25 years, uh, Technology Vision Group, uh, and Stephanie and I have known each other for a very long time, the vision part of it came from Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, which is, his statement was, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. So my job was, for 25 years, was to find investments that, you know, most people weren't thinking about, and uh, I think I beat the odds on that one. So I've been involved in a lot of very successful deals. Uh, which allowed me to kind of move into this big health space. Um, my experience of venture capitalists uh, in most of the countries where they exist is that there's a carrot and a stick. And the carrot is profit. Every venture capitalist I've ever met is in it to make money. And if they're not in it to make money, they're in it not for profit, whether they like it or not. The stick is the law. So. They, they do what they can do as long as it's within the law. And uh, I know a lot of lawyers and all the famous firms that make a fortune off the biotech companies, because while I agree there's integrity and ethics, I don't believe personally that they are morally driven. They're driven to, in science and to be successful and to make money, and they, they don't want to cross the law. And I'm going to give a little pitch for our, our moderator here. Bob Klitzman, who's bringing out a new book with Oxford University Press in September, uh, Designing Babies. And he's going to be our guest speaker in January at the Commonwealth Club of California. You are all invited. And I think the topic of designing babies, I think, is, is provocative for this panel and maybe another conference in Columbia, because we've been largely talking about the United States and California, but we live in a global economy, and money goes where it and I guarantee you, if you can think of it, someone's doing it right now. So I believe that there are many individuals outside the U.S. and perhaps in the U.S. that do not have a moral compass in science and technology. And that's what your book, you know, you have raised the question, if you were a parent and you could design your children to have certain traits, guaranteed to get into Harvard, <laughs> Would you do it? Not the crew pitch. So I think I think your book your book is as is showing that it's plus five hundred science and technology <laughs> is take I haven't read it yet, but I believe as taking us to a whole new level of discourse. Well thank you. Yes, I, I try. <laughs> thank you for the plug. So um, so I'm gonna I wanna thank our guests. But before I do, I just wanna say that I uh, mention our bioethics program. So if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion uh, and found it provocative. Uh, we have on our website lots of other discussions uh, uh, on other topics in bioethics. Uh, we had the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Johnson & Johnson uh, recently talking about her perspectives on these issues. We had a, uh, a, a webinar, several panelists on the 21st Century Cures Act uh, on issues of drug company pricing. We've had Oliver Sacks. We've had a, it's all free on our website. Check it out. We also just want to say briefly have a uh, courses or, of course, ethics in the pharmaceutical industry that we're going to have here for as a five-day intensive uh, uh, next year, uh, probably uh, um, uh, actually a year from now. Um, uh, we also have a certificate program. We have a master's program, uh, both partly here, partly in New York, et cetera, partly online. You can do whatever you want. Um, so uh, uh, check it out. Um, but um, most importantly, I want to thank um, you all for coming and especially thank our amazing panelists. So please join me in thanking them.
and uh, we hope you'll stay around and uh, have some refreshments. And uh, we look forward to having you here visit for a future event. And thank you. And that was amazing, guys. That was great. I think there's, 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 there could be, we could have gone on, but. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah.